It's crazy what happens when God does work in our life, and then we can stand in the authority of that. Our God is not a God to think about or to simply ponder, but he is a God to be experienced. And you don't get moments like that without God rescuing and redeeming you. And today I am so excited not only to say thank you, Jesus, for what you've done in Amanda's life, but we up here today in a few moments are going to celebrate Baptism Sunday here at the Avenue Church. Yeah, let's give it up for Baptism Sunday. And we're going to be baptizing people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what, baptize, what baptism signifies is an, out, it's an outward expression of an inward change, meaning God has rescued and redeemed their heart through the work and person of Jesus Christ. And we're celebrating that today. And I'm glad uh, that you get to be with us uh, for that. My name is Casey, and I get to serve as one of your pastors uh, today. And uh, today is going to be an awesome day. I'm believing for it, that God wants to meet you in a really cool way. We're in session two of a new series called Busy. And we're looking at what, my, what life might look like in, a, in a, a, a little bit of a less hurried way. Uh, what would it be like for us to eliminate hurry and create some more margin and intentional space for God to show up and for us to be able to experience uh, this God of rescue and, and renewal? And so that's what we've been looking at uh, week one, and this is week two. And I have some numbers uh, to start with today uh, for you guys, okay? Do you guys like numbers? Any number, any number of people out there? All right, uh, let, let's check this out here. 705, 2,737 and a half, 1,600, 2,617, and 10,000. 705. Average hours spent by the average American on social media per year. 705. 2,737 and a half amounts the average American spends watching TV a year. 1,600. The amount of books that could be read in a year using 3,442 and a half of those hours on books rather than TV and social media. I think that number's a little aggressive, by the way, but I'm just saying you get the idea. You could do a lot of other things. 2,617. The average amount an iPhone user touches his or her phone a day. I have sources for these, by the way, if you're curious. Just email me and I can give you the sources. I'm not just making this stuff up as you touch your iPhone to Google to see if I'm right or not. 10,000, average amount of hours that a 21-year-old male spends on video games, if indeed they are a gamer. And so as we think about hurry, it's like, of course we have to hurry when you add the numbers up. Like, just add those numbers up and say, um, I would like to be a person who has a, a successful career. That's a great goal. Well, that goal plus these numbers means that you're going to have to hustle. I'd like to have a successful marriage. Awesome goal. Check it out. Do the math real quick and, and understand that the only option you're left with is to hustle. Oh, I'd like to invest in my kids. I'd like to be a part of my community. I'd like to join God on the rescue and renewal of all creation. Awesome. You only have one choice left, and it's called a life of hurry. And so this has become our usual way. It's just simply usual for us to hurry. The author of the book, The Relentless Elimination of Hurry, John Mott Comer, says this, not only does hurry keep us from the love, joy, and peace of the kingdom of God, the very core of what all human beings crave, but it also keeps us from God himself simply by stealing 
our attention. And with hurry, we always lose more than we gain. You ever notice that? I gave you a quote in your outline. You have an outline uh, here today, and it was, it was at the bottom of last week's outline, and the quote was by John Mark as well. And um, like I said, many of the things that this series is looking at thematically and, and even material-wise come from uh, that book, The uh, Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. And uh, the quote that I gave you last week from him was uh, something to the effect of, uh, my worst moments come when I am in a hurry. Isn't that true? I mean, think of that as a friend or as, you know, um, a husband or, or even coming to church today. Who was in a hurry coming to church today? Anybody? Anybody? I, I, my hand is up because I'm on a different schedule than you, but I was hurried in my schedule. And um, we're never at our best, are we? We're never, you're never at like your shining moment when you're, when you're hustling to an event. I have children who will attest to that, who get to see uh, quick, um, almost not quite angry, but like uh, it can be a, a, a different tone of voice, dad, in the midst of hurry. As a matter of fact, even this morning, I, I, was, I was driving on Federal Highway, and I, and I, you know how something happens, and you're like, did that just happen? So I saw this really odd accident. It was okay, it wasn't like a, a horrible thing. But, but a golf cart ran into a car, and I was behind it, I thought. And this was like at the corner of Federal and Atlantic. And so I saw it happen, and I'm like, first of all, that's surreal, that a golf cart and a car ran into each other. And like, I, I drove by, it looked like everyone was okay. And then I kept going, I'm like, I think I should stop. Like, I, like but I, you know, you're kind of like, I was in my head, and I was, you know, I was, in, in a little bit of hurry mode. And so I eventually went back and like walked up on like, are you okay? And everyone was okay. But it was just like that moment of like in a hurry, I don't do my best loving. And, and you can probably relate to that as well and, and maybe have people who, who would support that comment of both you and themselves. And, and that's probably why, uh, at least partially why, Dallas Willard um, says this, you must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. We talked last week about a conversation that he had with John Ortberg, a, a guy he was mentoring, and John wanted to know what did he needed to do, for, what's like my next thing in the ministry, what do I need to do, and, and, and this was his response, you just need to slow down, man. You just need to slow down, because as you slow down, it gives your God the opportunity to speak for you to experience his love that will actually transform you and transform the way you live. You see, here's the thing. Um, if we desire the greater works that Jesus promises us that we're going to do, because in John 14, Jesus is like, listen, you're going to do these greater works even than I did. And so he makes this fantastic promise to his disciples of which we now receive. And we're believing that that's going to be great evangelistic efforts. And, and so he, here's the deal, though. If we want to do the greater works that Jesus' promise is to us, then we have to adopt the greater way that Jesus invites us to. The greater works and the greater way, they go hand in hand. So if you are always hustling and if you are always in a hurry and if you are always living with very thin margins— it's going to be like radically impossible for you to see the greater works that God has both for you and the people around you. And now God is an amazing God, and he can do what he wants and when he wants. But as we look at this time and time again, it's going to take a greater way. And that's what we're going to look at today. And, and so we're going to be in Matthew chapter 11. The, the words will be on the screen here for you to follow. Um, in, in Matthew 11, Jesus uh, talks to his disciples, and um, the context here, let me get there. Matthew 11. So, he starts back in, in verse 25, and he says, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, 
that you've hidden these things from the wise and understanding. You've revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, uh, for such was your gracious will. All things you have handed over to me by the Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Okay, and so Jesus is saying he has this, like, special knowledge of the Father. And, and the reason for that is, first of all, the nature of Jesus. Jesus was God the Son and had dwelt eternally with God the Father and God the Spirit. And so there was this eternal, intimate relationship that Jesus had with the Father which would allow for him to be able to express things about the Father that nobody knew about besides Jesus. And so he had experience with the Father. He had intimacy uh, with the Father. It says he and the Father were one, so there were, it was... It was like the nature of the Father lived in Jesus, and the nature of Jesus lived in the Father, although they're two separate persons. But one of the ways that Jesus is able to make a statement like this, that he's got things about the Father that nobody else could know, is because of the way that Jesus lived even while here on earth. The pace at which Jesus kept allowed him to stay in intimate contact with the Father. And then this is the invitation he makes. Verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is is light. Jesus as the new way. He's making some pretty audacious promises here, and so we want to we want to take a look at, at Jesus as the new way. We've already said that you have a usual way, correct? The usual way is pretty much littered by those numbers, and I'm a, I'm a part of that, and and I don't want this to um, sound as though this is in any way some sort of uh, condemnation. Uh, when, when John Mark wrote the book and he preached the messages that went along with the book, he was very careful to say, hey, this isn't about condemnation, and I don't want you to hear any kind of condemnation. This is more invitation. This is more like, okay, this is where we are, but there, there's, there's quite possibly a better way to live, a new way to live, and, and that's that's what we want to explore here today. So we want to explore Jesus as the new way. The, the, this, the invitation that he makes here in this passage has the potential to be radically transforming. I mean, can you imagine a life that was devoted to and saturated with rest? You know, just as a matter of fact, I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to even rest this week, physically, spiritually, emotionally. And Jesus, is, he, he's making this invitation. He's saying, if you will come to me, I'll give you this type of radical rest that you've never experienced before. I mean, I wonder in the pace of our lives, and even sometimes in the pace at which I preach, we're just moving so fast that we may miss what he wants to do. So what if you guys join me for one minute before we dive into this teaching of rest? What if we just practiced the exercise of coming to Jesus for that rest? And I have right here my, my phone. This doesn't count as a touch, by the way. Don't, it doesn't, see, I'm, I'm holding the, the case. I'm just going to look at my phone for a minute. We're just going to be quiet. We're just going to practice rest. If you know Jesus, just come to Jesus again and invite him to give you that rest. If you don't, just maybe curiously think about what a life of rest uh, would look like. And so let's just be quiet and see if the Lord maybe just wants to even encourage us uh, over a minute of rest. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll continue.
All right. Jesus as the new way. As the new way. Well, let's take a look at um, one of your blanks here on your outline. If we can take, take a look at this slide here. Uh, as, we, as we walk through this passage, um, we're going we're gonna, to... Um, be centered in these verses here, but we're going to look at them um, uh, in, in a little bit of a, uh, uh, just a, I think, hopefully encouraging way to you guys where we pick out a few things uh, to camp out on. The first one is Jesus making a promise of a new way. He's, don't, don't misunderstand that this is a promise of a new way. And what is that promise? The promise is rest. The promise is rest. We are in the political season, are we not? I mean, it's heating up. It's heating up. Okay, it's even heating up in Delray, right? Like, we, you see signs, and you're voting, and, um, you know, election time is coming. And, and um, I'm not saying everyone always, but one of the um, marks of the fact that the political season is here is that there is uh, oftentimes in the air a sense where people over-promise and under-deliver. Is that, is that fair? I mean... Just kind of like, it's, it's just kind of in the air. I'm not saying who or what or where. I'm just saying that in the political season, usually there's a sense where big promises are made, but then, but then an under-deliverance um, can, can oftentimes follow that. And, 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 I'm, and I'm here to say that the rest that Jesus promises is, is an over-deliverance. He makes a big promise and then he over-delivers on that promise. Now, we could talk about Old Testament rest. We could talk about rest that's to come when he is um, going to come back and renew all things. But I just want to give some personal testimony because many of you know, many of you know the struggle that I have as your friend and as your pastor um, with just kind of the darkness of anxiousness. It's not a foreign thing to you if you've been at this church. It just it ends up making it in a lot of messages. And th- so you know that there's a side where um, I, I limp along with many of you um, under the daily pressure and darkness of anxiousness. What you don't know as well is the victory that God has been giving me and the rest that God has been giving me as I continue to come and learn new ways coming to Jesus over and over and over again. I'm in a chapter of my life where I have experienced freedom and rest like I don't think I have ever experienced it before. It's not without start and starts and stops. It's not without like ups and downs. It's not without like uh, emotions that are sometimes unexplainable and like this morning, I don't know why I've feel and felt nervous and off and awkward. You ever wake, you ever kind of have a morning like that? You're like, I, maybe it's because I was running late or whatever, but you just kind of feel off and you can't, like, so, so those things are still kind of part of my reality. But, but God has been taking me in to the promised land of himself and giving me this rest that I could not find anywhere else, and I just want to make sure in the midst of trying to be vulnerable and connect, I also have to be vulnerable and give praise to Jesus and let you know that his rest is crazy beautiful and available. I know personally as one who's experiencing it. The promise of rest. What kind of rest is he talking about? What, what is, what's he talking about when he says rest? And um, Jesus was one who believed and, and taught a gospel that was holistic. If you don't know much about Jesus, he loved to feed people. He loved to heal people. He cared about people in every dimension of their life. So it wasn't just like Jesus is here to save your soul, but he doesn't care about your emotions. It wasn't like Jesus is just over here in this one corner, like, so you can get to heaven, and he doesn't care about whether you thrive here in this earth or not. I mean, like, if you look at the life of Jesus, he, the kingdom of God was touching every area to bring renewal. And so the rest that he promises is in every area that you might learn a new spiritual, emotional, physical, and mental rest that you've never had before outside of Jesus. It's just that good. Um, one of the 
authors that we often come back to because I often live there is uh, a guy by the name of um, Tim Chester. And he writes the four G's. Now check this out. What if God were to give you rest in these four areas? What would your life look like? The first area is because God is, is so great in Jesus Christ, you don't have to have control. Wouldn't that be awesome if you lived like a day where you weren't in control and God just gave you rest from the need of control and all the resulting anger and anxiety that comes out of that? Or what about God is so good in Jesus that you don't need to look elsewhere, and you just had one 24-hour period of resting from looking anywhere else besides the person of Jesus as your treasure and your delight. And, And God is so glorious that you don't need to fear others. I mean, what if you had one 24-hour period of absolute rest from the need of approval from anyone else? And what if, what if God was just so gracious in Christ that it freed you from the need to prove yourself over and over and over again to God or to yourself or to others? I mean, wouldn't that type of rest transform your life and give you something good to talk about with others? I mean, maybe our evangelism stalls because we're yet to experience the rest that Jesus promises us, and and we're still trying to be convinced that we've got someone to share that makes a difference in people's lives. And so my prayer for you is that you would come and experience this rest that Jesus promises and over-delivers on in each of these areas in more. Well, the second thing is he offers a path. He offers a, a, a path to this new way of living. He says, he, he says very simply, come to me. The path has come. That, that's how we get the rest, is by coming to Jesus. Uh, famous preacher Charles Spurgeon said, uh, Jesus' favorite word was come. We might think it's Go. You know, and he writes in his message or a commentary that I was reading. It's like, it, it's, it's, it's on the come side, not necessarily the go side, but you might have met a Jesus that um, y- all you can hear is go and make disciples or go and be different or go and fix your life. And Jesus' heartbeat is actually come. Come to me. And then I'll send you out different. I'll send you out in rest. But you not, you're not going to get that out there unless you come here to me, the person of Jesus. I'm not sure if you're familiar with um, escape rooms or not. Anybody like escape rooms? Okay. I'll, I still like you. I just don't, I can't stand escape rooms. And I was in an escape room situation not too long ago with, with a bunch of people, and I did what I, I, I've, I think I've done this like my entire life, uh, high school, anything. When, when, there's, when there's like a group project or there's a thing that's happening, my first step is usually like here. Like, y'all just, and I'll, yeah, you're doing great. And, and so in an escape room, you know, like everyone's participating, and then some people just take their natural paths. And um, the, the thing about an escape room is you've got to find the right path. It's all about finding the right path out. And so you're like looking at this key and you're looking behind stuff and you're lifting stuff and and, and all these sort of things. And and you can you can take either um, either two ways to finding the right path. You can either do what I do, which is I go right into chill mode. Like I'm not above this, I just don't like it. (laughs) I'm not trying to look down on you all. I'm just not into this. Uh, and 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 so I'm just gonna hang out here because I find it awkward to like trying to get super involved in this. Or you can be the person that's just grinding at every level. And you're looking here and you're looking there and you're, you're just kind of looking everywhere. Well, listen, life's the same way. You've got two kind of choices in life. You can be the person that, that kind of camps out back here and is like, I don't know. And man, I, you know, like I don't even think I purpose in life and eternal life, all that stuff. Like, yeah, Jesus is the whole thing. I can, I can take it or leave it, but I'm not really getting involved like that. Or you can be the person that is looking 
uh, uh, for every latest and greatest self-help or what about this or reading that book and this. And you're always looking for the path. And here's what Jesus has to say to you and he has to say to me. Come to me. Don't come to a, a religious event. Don't come to a religion. Don't come to a certain set of, of, of like, well, I agree to these things. And I'm, no, no, no. Jesus is like, listen, I'm a person. Come to me just as you are. All you who labor and are heavy laden, just as you are. Come to me. Jesus says, hey, don't go get cleaned up. Don't go fix anything. Don't go figure anything out. Don't go try to get unbusy. Just come to me as you are right now. Come to me. This is not preaching. This is an invitation to some of you who have never come to Jesus. To hear through this broken guy who's still figuring out rest that Jesus is calling you to come just as you are. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that before we continue. Would you pray with me? Father, I'm believing that there are some in um, your presence here this morning that you simply want to invite to come to you. And so as they hear my words, would they hear your heart? And would they feel the invitation of you, Jesus, inviting them just as they are, just where they are in life, just with the knowledge and understanding they have to come to you. If that's you, you can simply respond and say, Jesus, I'm here. I'm coming. And I believe what you're inviting me to. Rest because you've died for my sin and have overcome it through your resurrection. Forgive me. I turn to you and I believe for rest. Amen. Amen. The third thing we see here in this passage is the practice of a new way. Like there's a practice that's happening um, that Jesus is inviting us into uh, in this way. And, and what he says here is, take my yoke upon you. And um, a yoke is, uh, it's a farming piece of equipment that would put two animals together and um, it would harness their power together. And here's what Jesus is inviting us to. Put my yoke upon you so that we can harness my power through you. I can teach you a new way, but I can't teach you a new way to live if you're going to not be yoked to me. So Jesus is inviting us to come and, and, and have an intimate relationship with him and know him, watch this, not just as our treasure, but as our trainer. Not just as our savior, but as our sponsor. Like, Imagine this, guys. Um, what if, what if uh, you know, I, I work out. I do. It's true. Um, once a week. I'm super consistent about that, except I missed this week. I know you can probably tell. Um, and I went into my trainer. His name is Julian. And I was like, Julian, what's up, man? Uh, he's like, hey, good to see you. And we had a little chit-chat at the beginning. And, uh, and then uh, he, he said, all right, man, let's, uh, let's get to the abs. And I said, you know what? I just, I just want to talk to you. I just, I, man, you know what, Julian, I just want to uh, tell you how great you are, and, uh, you know, I'm just, uh, I have a lot of uh, positive emotion for you right now, Julian, and I just want to hang out with you over here, and he would say, yeah, that's cool, man, but, but listen, um, you know, if, if we don't get over here to the abs, you know, you're not going to get any stronger, and I said, yeah, but you know what, the abs hurt, man, I don't really feel like doing abs, as a matter of fact, if we want to do something, we could do legs, because I'm kind of, you know, I could do, I'm, I'm okay, I'm a runner, that kind of fits my, it fits my personality better. So what if we worked on legs today, Julian? Or what if you came into your sponsor, and it was, four, it was like fourth step time, and you're like, ah, I don't really feel like a fourth step. 
um, you know, uh, the first three I'm cool with and I really like, you know, step seven, eight. Can we just, you know, and listen, by the way, I love having you as my sponsor. You're, you're the greatest sponsor I've ever had. You stay with me. You love me. And, and you are super affectionate towards your sponsor or your trainer, but you never did the stuff the trainer or the sponsor was telling you to do. I think sometimes that's how I live out my relationship with Jesus. I love you and I'm super affectionate. I just don't want to train with you. I'm not sure I want the yoke because that would mean I'd need to leave some of those numbers that we started off with in order to actually follow and stay close enough to you for your power to become my power. Jesus offers the practice of a new way by taking his yoke upon you and learning from you. And what I mean by that is there's like a specific way that Jesus did life that I want to invite you to as we end and then explore in depth over the next couple of weeks. The first one is this, solitude. Solitude and silence. So, so Jesus had a way of living and he's inviting us into that way. So it's not just do this and don't do that. No, Jesus is saying, um, come and, and do life as I did it. And there, there's a couple of places in the scripture where you'll see as was his custom, which means this is something that he did on the regular. And one of the first ones is solitude. I mean, this isn't in order, forgive me, it's just the way I, the book, and then I kind of made some changes here, but this is, this is our order for today. Solitude, and this is how we will be going through them over the next four weeks. So we're going to spend a week on each of these, but I just want to introduce them to you today. The first one is solitude. Jesus regularly got away. He regularly um, went and found solitude. Um, it appears as though early in the morning was a good time for him, but, but th there's no like set time necessarily, but there was a set rhythm. So if you're going to take the yoke of Jesus on you, what he's inviting you to do is to create space for solitude where you get away from the noise and all the stuff, even the good stuff of the world, so that he might have the opportunity to speak to you, to encourage you, to meet you where you are. The second one is Sabbath. Sabbath. We see in Luke 4, 16 that Jesus, as was his custom, was, was in the uh, synagogue and um, he was reading the Torah. And so he, was, he took Sabbath regularly. And we're, we're going to take a look at the importance of taking a Sabbath and having that be a regular rhythm, not because you have to, but because Jesus wants to give you himself under the yoke of Sabbath. Slowing. Slowing. I'm sorry, I just skipped through Sabbath. You might, that might be a new word to you. Sabbath is a 24-hour period of time where you intentionally rest and delight yourself in Jesus. And if that's new to you, that's awesome because Jesus' invitations, he wants to teach you things and give you himself in that process. And we'll talk about what that looks like and some of the practical uh, outpourings of that. Slowing, slowing. Um, if, you, if you look at Jesus' life, you can see that his pace, it wasn't slow in the sense that we think of slow, but it was probably slower than ours. He had time for meals. He had time for interruption. There was a pace about Jesus' life that we can learn from and we'll look at, practically speaking. And then finally, simplicity. Simplicity. Jesus is like, seek first the kingdom of God and I'll give you all this other stuff. What would it look like for us to put the yoke of Jesus on ourselves and live in a more simple way where he has more margin to speak and capture our hearts than the things that many of us are captured by. And so our final thought here is, is the price. The price. Well, what about the price of a new way? And I started off thinking that God wanted me to tell you and encourage you, hey, listen, um, there's going to be a price to pay for this new life. And, and, you know, like we might like the idea of a new life with Jesus, but we don't always like the price of it, almost like the example I gave with the workout trainer and stuff like that. And then I just felt like he redirected me, and he's like, no, 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 you're not supposed to focus on the price that you're going to pay. You're supposed to focus on the price that I've already paid to give people rest. I want to tell you a story. It was on a Thursday night. Jesus and his crew, they were having a meal, and, and, and th there was like something in the air, and Jesus let them know, I'm going to die and I'm going to die for you. The, 
the bread and the wine, it's, it's going to be in remembrance of what happens to me because I'm about to be broken and my blood is about to be poured out for the forgiveness of uh, your sin. And Jesus knew that on the cross, my lustful heart that looks for uh, joy and goodness in other places outside of Jesus, my heart that, that is very difficult to rest, man, it wanders frequently. And he was going to die for that, and he was going to die for all of the things that you brought in this morning, specifically and personally. He knew that the cross would hold those things for him, and he knew that there was a penalty for our selfishness, for our desire to find life outside of God. Jesus knew on that Thursday night he was going to suffer the penalty so that you and I could be forgiven of it through faith in his finished work. He was arrested, he was tried. He was put on a cross and crushed. And on the third day, because he was willing to experience the darkness of the chaos, he bought something for you. And it's called rest. And he invites you to that this morning. Now, as we turn to our baptism moment, and we think of that price that Jesus paid. There is a response to that price. Jesus says, come to me if you want what I have to offer. Come to me. And baptism signifies people who have heard that message that there is rest available because Jesus took their place and now offers it to them. And they've said yes through faith through repentance. That's what baptism signifies, that I'm turning on one life that looks for my rest and my joy and my delight outside of Jesus. I'm done with that life, and I'm trusting that Christ, what you've done for me is enough to forgive me and give me that rest that my soul longs for. So when you see people in the water, remember, that they once lived a life of unrest and that Jesus took that unrest on the cross so that they, with him, could be resurrected out of the water just as he was resurrected out of the grave because by faith they are now joined to a resurrected Jesus. Amen? So this is our gospel message, and this is our gospel moment. If you are to be baptized, would you come, and uh, Mitch, would you gather them? This is Mitch over here, and uh, I'm going to ask Daniel to come, and um, we're going to uh, play a song right now, and, and the song's going to be about uh, seeing a victory. And, and this is a victory that these people are proclaiming that, have, that has happened because of their faith in Christ's finished work. And as we prepare to go into the tank and, and make this public proclamation, I want to ask you guys a question. If I could have your attention just for a minute, because, because it's, it's important to publicly proclaim before we get to this moment. Do you guys all, do you guys all understand yourself to be sinners without any hope besides the hope of Christ crucified and resurrected? Is that a yes for you guys? And do you now devote yourself to coming to Jesus, both in this moment and for the rest of your life, for the rest that only he can give? Is that a yes? All right. Let's do this, Avenue Church. Amen? In case you can't hear me, which you probably won't because we're going to sing over you and we're going to ask for you to remain seated for the first part while everyone's getting baptized so you can see. Uh, and the second part, the, one of our leaders will ask you to stand and worship with us. But I will be baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the only one who can do this work. Oh 
So good, so good to be here for this. What a, what a beautiful testimony of who Jesus is and what he did for us. Uh, so good, so good. Uh, just a couple quick announcements. I'm going to pray for all of us, especially for those who are just baptized. Don't forget Shape Sunday right after service. If you want to know how God has shaped you to serve him, come join us in the next building down the sidewalk over in the Avenue Church offices starting at noon. Everyone is welcome. Okay, everyone is welcome to be a part of that. Also, prayer partners, if you guys want to come and assemble on the sides, if you have prayer needs today, any prayer need whatsoever for yourself or for another, come see our prayer partners. They want to pray uh, with you and for you and uh, see what greater works God does um, in your life. All right, you guys ready to pray? Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this day. Father, thank you for the, the word and calling us to rest in you, our, our Savior, our Lord, our Sustainer, our friend, our everything. And Father, we thank you for the testimony we've seen uh, this morning and those who have been baptized, showing that they know you and love you and believe in you, Father. We pray that you'd bless them. Father, help them connect with individuals in their lives who can, who can help them to follow Jesus, help them connect uh, with groups that can do the same and, and with our church and beyond. Lord, bless them. Uh, touch them by your Holy Spirit. Give them that great, deep, abiding sense of adoption that they are your children, beloved, valued, cherished. Father, now bless us as we go. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys.